Good evening. Thank you for joining us today for Sister Girls Night In. Today we have Ashley Antoinette. Ashley Antoinette is a New York Times bestselling author and television writer. She has sold over 2 million books in her 20 year career and has a catalog of over 50 novels. She is the literary agent responsible for brokering one of the most significant civil rights based book deals for Tamika D. Mallory and co author of the nonfiction book State of Emergency. As an author and agent, her goal is to bring voices of color to the table and diversify the content published by major publishing houses. Ashley is also a member of the prestigious Writers Guild of America. Thank you for joining me, Ashley. Thank you for having me, Mai. I'm excited. Right. Thank you. Hey, sister girl. Hey, girl. So, hey. <laughs> <laughs> that is one hell of a resume, Ashley. Thank you. And, you know, it just doesn't really feel like a resume. You collect these accolades over the years. And then when somebody tells you to put it all on paper, you're like, oh, wait, I've kind of done a lot. So, <laughs> well, um, thank you for sitting down with me because I am honored right now. Of course. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start with my first question. You wear many hats. You know, you're an author, influencer, mother, wife, businesswoman, and so many more. How do you juggle them all? Um, sometimes I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I don't set out to be all of these things in one day. I just set out to be me. You know what I mean? I love to write. I've always had a passion for writing. Um, being a wife and a mom, though that's who I am intrinsically inside. I love to love on my family. The influencer I don't really claim or see. I just try to put intention and good energy out into the world and attract like-minded women to sit at my table and um, to be a part of my community. I don't set out to have any type of influence, but I am honored that people value what I think and the words that I use and say. Um, I just do it, you know, like I don't really think about it. I just wake up and feel like I'm capable of conquering anything. So all of the pieces and all of the individual goals that I set, somehow they, they work together and they fall in place. Um, when I set my mind to something, I'm super focused and laser focused on getting that done. So I don't think about the other irons that I have in the fire. I, I'm just like, okay, yeah, let's get that done. Let's do it. And somehow it just always works out. Yeah. What is a day like for Ashley Antoinette? Oh, child. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I wake up and I'm, I'm a mom and wife first. So I make sure my son is set, you know, and all of his school activities. Um, I make sure my husband is set. I, I do whatever I need to do to keep the home life happy first. Um, and then I, I focus on my self-care. I work out. I get dressed. I present Ashley Antoinette, the brand. And then I hop into my bougie hippie business first um, because I can write anywhere. I write all day, every day, whether I'm in a Zoom meeting, I'm probably jotting notes on the side or I have my phone open and I'm like writing a chapter while I'm in the middle of a meeting. Um, I handle all of those zooms for bougie hippie first. After that, I roll into wearing my agent hat. I'm an agent at Europa content. So I always tap into my authors and my client list next. I'm always on the lookout for new talent or new voices that aren't existing on shelves. Um, after that, I, I turn everything off by 5 PM. I'm on do not disturb. My son is from school. Um, my husband is typically finished with his day by then, and then I'm able to tap into the creativity of being an author. So I write typically from 5 p.m. to about 2 a.m. Um, in the morning. Okay. What is one thing you learned later in the industry that you would like to share with other authors? Um, Later in the industry, I learned to trust my own voice to trust my intuition as a creative. I learned to not really chase trends, to not try to write within a certain genre, to not try to follow the crowd. I, I started to trust my words. I started to trust the vision that I wanted for myself as an author and I wanted to leave an impact when my career was over. And I realized that in order to do that, I had to give my fan base me as well as the characters. It couldn't just be, I was writing good books um, because there are a lot of good books out, out there. I had to 
put myself inside the work. I have to leave my beliefs on the page, leave my essence um, on the invisible ink in the pages. And once I began to do that, I think I started to tap into the psyche of women and not just into a means to an end. You know, I didn't want them to just say, oh, Ashley can write. She writes great books. I wanted them to kind of know me and feel me at the end of an Ashley Antoinette story. And I didn't learn how to do that until about probably six or seven years ago. Oh, okay. Is there a genre you, you're scared to write in, but you want to try? Um, No. So I'm not really afraid to do anything. And I think that's why I do a little bit of everything. Um, No, I, I feel like I'm capable of pulling off anything creatively. Um, and when I have those, those notions or those inklings to try something different, I do it. I really wanted to write a YA book um, a few years ago. And it was just a booming industry for Black authors. There were so many Black authors emerging in that space, getting major deals. And I took a trip to... Cuba and then to Mexico to see Chichen Itza. And all of this culture was just infused in my brain and I wanted to use it in some way. Um, and so I partnered with my son. He was quite was young at that time. He might've been seven. Um, I partnered with him and we stepped into the YA space and wrote an amazing book. So I wasn't really afraid. I just kind of, I said, I want to do it. Let's do it. I also wanted to prove that I could be more than a street fiction writer. I could be more than a women's fiction writer. And Donald Goins book, Swamp Man, made me want to do that. I remember reading that book and being like, this is so different from anything else in his catalog. It just showed a skill that proved he was a storyteller. He was a true scribe. He wasn't someone who could be placed in a box and locked in there. So once I read that, it made me want to explore a different genre. And I'm sure, you know, the more I live and learn um, and the more I aspire to be a better creative, I'll probably tap into other forms. I know for sure that I want to tap into like the Creole cult culture of Louisiana. So don't be surprised oh. if you find some type of mystical mysticism in some of my books in the future. Yeah, and that book was Behind the Wall, The Girl Behind the Wall? Yes. Yes, I remember that. How do you get in your creative space? I know you just mentioned um, you traveled and that's how you, you know, you saw things and that, that made you get. Is there a specific, like, routine you go through before you start writing? Like, you know, some people have to have their tea and their, you know, their, uh, their, you know, I know you do crystals and things like that. So what what is what is it like for you? How do you get in your face? So the crystals and the sage, those are more so for my mental health. Like those are for, that's to clear my space, to clear yeah. my palate. You know, I interact with so many different people, so many different girls in mm -hmm. Ash Army every day. There's so much energy coming my way. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's not so great. Um that is just a, a tool for me to just reset my energy. But I don't believe in necessarily having the same routine every single time I write. Um, in order to be a professional writer, you have to treat it like a profession. So I might not be able to set my routine every time it's time for me to do my job. Yeah. So no, I don't need a candle. I don't need a crystal. I don't need a glass of wine. I don't need a quiet room. I do my job mm -hmm. everywhere, every day. Um, whether I'm in a busy airport and there's noise all around me, I've been in a school pickup line, literally on my phone, finishing chapters. Like when you are a professional, you have to get it done. There's no excuse to not get it done. So I've stopped um, relying on that perfect environment to set my vibe. My vibe as a creative needs to be, I need to be ready to do my job at all times. Okay. Um, there is the novice writer, you know, who probably has the luxury to do that. They probably can sit back and pa paint a pretty picture in a perfect environment every time. I don't have that luxury anymore. So I I've stopped letting that be the excuse to not write. And I write all the time everywhere, no matter the circumstance. Gotcha. Gotcha. 
You have an app called Book Lovers um, that introduces a, a new author. Well, not really new, but a new to you author to your readers every month. Why was it important for you to introduce other talented authors to your readers? And how do you feel about the success of your app? Um, I, I have a few answers to that question. So I believe that people at the top don't compete. They want to make their industry and their space better. When I first entered this industry, it was hella competitive. It was hella, I was young. I, I wanted everything that I saw everybody at the top have. And I worked until I got that. And then when you're at the top, you realize you're the only one in the room. You're the only black face in these creative rooms at a high level. And it became my goal to see other people that look like me get there. Um, I also have a very demanding fan base. Ash Army is, they have made my career. They are so loyal, but a lot of them don't love reading. They love me. They love my yeah. book. And so I felt like it was my responsibility to say, hey, no, y'all missing out on some dope content out here. There are some talented writers who are being overlooked, who don't have the access to the rooms that I sit in, who don't have the access or even the know-how to get their work in front of you. A lot of authors are talented, but they lack skills in marketing. They lack skills in book packaging. They lack skills in building community. My community is already built and they're primed and they're hungry and thirsty for new content. So it just made sense for me to take that leadership position in the industry and say, yeah, it's time to expose these Black readers to more Black authors. Um, and it's it's been... A labor of love because I am a black woman who owns an app that is a tech space. It's a new space for me. Um, it's not easy. It takes a lot of funding, a lot of know-how, but we're working out the kinks. We're not Amazon, but one day we will be. You know, <laughs> I, I partner with Bianca, an amazing editor who takes it extremely seriously. Um, she dedicates her time. Thank you, B, for everything that you do. And together we curate this this group of talented people who have great stories to tell. Yes, and I've read all of them. They really are. Thank I haven't you. read a bad story yet. Thank um, you. You are hard. Bad because um, a lot of the authors that were featured and have been featured, they're some of my favorite authors. Um, and then when you brought in Jay, um, Jay Bernay back mm -hmm. into the mix, it was like we haven't heard from her for years. So it was good, you know, reading something new from her. Absolutely. Um, and I feel like sometimes an author can lose their confidence, you know, or mm -hmm. light and shake them off of their path. And so exactly. it's a reminder, like, no, sis, people are waiting on your art. People are waiting on your voice and you can, you can only use your voice. I can use my voice as Ashley Antoinette. The authors on my app, they have their own tone, their own style, and you can only write your type of story. So there is an audience for all of us. There's room for all of us. And I just want to make sure that authors are taking a seat at the table, you know, and getting Absolutely. the eyes on their work that they deserve. Absolutely. As a creative youth, you, you know, you often find yourself drowning in what your readers expect from you. How do you keep your composure with such a demanding fan base? Oh, yeah. Listen, I, I might have the most demanding fan base in Black fiction. Because I, uh, I think Butterfly Five have been out five days and they're like, where's Butterfly Six? And I'm like, yo. I have <laughs> they to, were already asking about Butterfly Six. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I have to sometimes stand my ground. Um, I don't know how long you follow urban fiction, but when I first started writing, my husband and I, we started together. So when Jaquavis and I first started writing, dropping a book more than every two years was not a thing. That was not a thing that authors did. Um, we started that rapid release schedule because there were two of us. We were a writing team. Um, and we came from a place where we needed this money to stay out of the streets. Like we've actually lived some of the lifestyles that we've written about. So in order to keep this legit money going, we had to write rapid releases. We had to write books or it was back to doing something that we weren't supposed to be doing. So when we started that, we had no idea that a, an entire industry of authors would come behind us and mimic that business model. Like, oh, we got to get these books out. We got to get these books out. 
now that I'm at a stage in my career where I appreciate the slow burn of being able to tell a story, I'm, I'm exercising my right to take a little bit more time. I don't think that any other author um, is expected to release books at the rate that my fan base expects me to release books. It's almost we superhuman. Little, we, we got a little spoil with ethics. A little bit, yeah, ethics. a little bit. But I was in a different creative space. Like I was, mm -hmm. there's a thing called your magnus opus as a creative. And if you look that up, it is the one project of your creative career that pushes you to a place of insanity. I was eating and breathing ethic. I was not tapped into my real life, my real roles as a mother, as a wife, as an entrepreneur. I was only focused on getting this story out of my system. Um, and I would write around the clock. I mean, I have never been in a creative space like that. And it has changed the way that I view my art. Um, but that doesn't always happen. You know, real life hit me very hard last year. I had an illness with my mom, my husband um, had a near-death experience, so I was forced to prioritize some things and actually tap into what it meant to be human first and an author second. Um, so I just stand my ground now. I'm like, y'all got to wait. You know, I've given you this body of work over these 20 years, and it's more than any average person can do realistically. So now I need y'all to be a little bit patient with me while I finish out this story. And I want it to be everything that you want it to be, that you expect it to be, and a little bit of what you don't expect. And in order for me to pull that off, I need the privacy and I need the time to do the story justice. So they get mad at me, but when I drop, they forget all about it. It'd be, yes. we'd be right back on the same page. Yes. Um, and also with the Butterfly Five, with the drop, how you did it, the rollout for that, that was one of, I, I've never... I don't want to say it hasn't been done before. I've never saw it done before with the scavenger hunts and the, you know, you um, passing out the books to certain locations. That was very, very different. I really, really liked that. Actually, it gave um, it, it, it put the it gave it more hype to me. It's like people going to different places in different cities, um, and then they, you know, asking the questions in your group. Um, trying to get the answers to it so they can go. That was real. I really like that. I, that was probably one of my favorite rollouts um, for a book. Um, we, another thing is we witnessed the, the whitewashing of co covers by Black authors. Basically, they, they want their, their covers to look a certain way so they can attract a different audience. How do you feel about that? Because I know in your books, you write you know, these characters are black, they're black as and that's what I'm, I'm rolling with. You don't shy away from being a black creative. Um, how, how do you, and you're successful with it. That's another thing. You're successful by being black, catering to black women, catering to black characters. You don't really venture out to try and get a different audience. What advice do you have for those who think that that's what they have to do to sell? Um. At the end of the day, I always strive for authenticity, right? And I am a black woman and I'm black on black on black. It ain't nothing, mm -hmm. that's my experience. So that is what I write. I also feel like there are enough other stories out there. There is a whole, when you walk mm -hmm. in the bookstore, there is 99% of the books on those shelves reflect a mainstream lifestyle, white characters by white authors. And it is up to me and authors of color to tell our stories. I don't think that authors understand how important their jobs are. I think authors back in the day, like the Harlem Renaissance and are our, our, the women and the men who paved the way for us, I think they understood clearly and they reflected Black life at the time that they were living it. Whether it was fiction or nonfiction, it was a reflection of time. That is our job. As authors, we have to take that job seriously. I can't reflect white life. I'm not white. I don't want to be white. I don't want to try to guess what it feels like to love from a white perspective, to hate from a white perspective, to fear something from a white perspective. That doesn't mean I'll never include white characters, but it means that my heroine, my main character, the energy that I'm given on this major platform, on these major shelves and these libraries that 
people are going to pick up is going to reflect my reality, which is that of a black woman. Mm -hmm. um, everybody doesn't understand the magnitude of that. Like long after I'm gone, I could die tomorrow and my books would be here in 50 years. That means I have a responsibility to my art, responsibility for my community, a responsibility to be the voice for black creatives. Um, I hope somebody walks behind me through all these doors that I'm opening and listen, not flip the table. Like I'm seating the table <laughs> for everything that you need to do to carry this legacy forward, but it's bigger than me. It's bigger than the author coming behind me. We, we have a voice and we have to use it. If we try to assimilate into white culture to for a few sales, I have white people who read my books and they love them because yeah. They're reading about an experience that they had no idea existed. So I'm never going to manipulate my culture to appease a mainstream audience. The mainstream has to come to me and respect what I'm doing and what I'm putting down. And people can feel authenticity. And as long as you're writing authentic stories, all types of people will gravitate to it. I think people forget about the marketing behind books. They put out the book and they want it to sell like, a million copies overnight, but they haven't done what it takes to market the book. You can attract a white audience with black characters. You just have to market it effectively. That's a great answer. That is a great answer. Um, so we're going to go into the butterfly five. Um, so I'm going to ask you, I want you to, you know, pick a character that you think, you know, um, describes the words I'm going to say. So which one of your characters deserve the most empathy in Butterfly 5? In just book five or the entire yes. series? Just book five. Um, the most empathy. I would say Messiah. And I know that he is he, he, people love to hate Messiah, but hmm. I think that people have to remove his actions from the page in book five, like they have this preconceived notion based on all of these prior actions that he, he has made. But if we just focus on five, the steps that he's taking to grow and to become a better man have to count for something. Now, growth doesn't mean a perfect, it's not perfect. Growth doesn't look perfect. Growth is messy. Growth is painful. You revert back to that old version of yourself a hundred times before you get it right. But he's trying and he's trying extremely hard to make up for pain that he's caused and time that he's missed. Um, so I, I empathize with that. I empathize with a black man that is trying his hardest to get it right and to fix what he's broken. Wow. What character should be the most thankful? Um, oh, that's a good one. I think that I'm trying to think of all the characters. I think Ethic should probably be the most thankful. <laughs> yeah, I think he should be the most thankful. I know he's going through a storm, um, mm -hmm. Lani not remembering him, but she could very well be in a grave. You know, like she could very well be gone. His daughter could have been gone and his family would have been in pieces. I think he has to look at what he still has standing around him and he has to start plugging the holes in his foundation. And I think that he has to really appreciate the presence of all of his children, all of his grandchildren, Messiah, in this village, this community of people that stand by him and, and with him through all of his turmoil. Um, a lot of times he can be very dismal. He can be very like, woe is me, but the fact that he has all of these people to love him through these hard moments and the way that they rally behind him, he really has built a community of love around him and those kids. What character is the most heroic? Um, I want to say Bella. Bella <laughs> is fearless. That girl is gone she going to go against anybody for her beliefs. You know, she's going to go against her daddy. She's going to go against Mo. She's going to cuss you out in the process. And she's going to make sure <laughs> that her little voice is a big voice in the room. So I think all of the, the alpha personalities that are in the book for this teenage girl to feel like she matters enough for people to 
they need to pause and, and take heed to what she's saying. I think that that takes some some courage at her age. What character is the most independent? Uh, probably Henny. I think mm -hmm. Hendrix is a young man who did not have it all. He didn't, he barely had anything. And I think he was trying to make the best life that he could for himself. He didn't really ask anybody for anything. He didn't expect no handouts. He might've been getting a hand over fist the wrong way, but he was going to make sure that he was okay. It took for Ethic to find out about his situation at home to, for him to even expect, and he didn't even, even expect help, but help came. Um, but without that, without the discovery of his problems, nobody would have ever known. And I think that it's because he felt like he was a little man moving around in the world when really he was just a young boy. I like that one. <laughs> what character is the most courageous? Correct. I think Lanika. I think Alani, I think it takes some courage to love after all of the loss that she's encountered. I think it takes courage to raise somebody else's kids, um, especially when that man took your child away. I think it takes courage to get out of the bed and keep fighting when you have, have experienced the loss of children, not just one. She lost two babies. And I think people forget that. Um, I think that she is a woman. She's emotional. She is, listen, anxious, like she's anxiety filled. She's difficult. But I think that she is still taking the steps to move on with her life. And I think after all of the pain and the loss that she's endured, I think that it, it definitely takes courage to do that. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to jump into this. So, you know, I didn't really, I didn't really like Morgan in this book. <laughs> I think Morgan is okay with being disliked. Yes, she has to be. So I didn't like how Morgan still failed to see that ethic is her father. And I see a lot of, uh, it's, it's been times where, you know, she says Benny, she goes to talk to Benny, but, it, you know, it, it forgive me if, you know, I'm thinking outside of what you think. But to me, when I read Moth to a Flame and got to know Benny, Benny was very stubborn. Benny was my way or the highway type of father where it seems like ethic is more of a nurturer. Ethic is more of a, you know, I, I'll i give you leniency, you know? And then after I see you can't handle the leniency, I'll step in. Mm -hmm. So it's like, when she's, when she's saying she missed her father and this, I'm like, you know, your father let your sister leave. You know, it, it was like, I'm leaving. You will realize when you messed up and you'll come back. Whereas ethic, he doesn't allow Morgan to get too far. It's, right. you know, he has the, the leash. Even though he gives her room, he has the leash on her. So it, when she compares it, I'm like, you know, to me, Ethic is a better father to her and to the kids than Benny was, but he just gets so much slack because he, did, he wasn't her biological father. I think um, I, have, I have a few responses to that. I think... Anybody misses what they don't have, right? We tend to take for granted what's there and we miss what we don't have. Also, when people are taken from you prematurely, you tend to idolize them. You put them in your heart and in your mind at the best memory you can think of with them. You know, Morgan was six when she lost her father. Well, maybe not yes. six. Y'all know, don't, don't count my mental math, but she was a she child. Was six. Yeah, she lost her father and she didn't necessarily understand or even know the dynamic that occurred between him and Raven. You know, she was still in a child's place. We know that she doesn't. There is a lot of gaps in that story in Morgan's mind about what occurred and how her life got to where it is. She loves Ethic, but she'll never love him more than her biological her father. father. She just can't. You know, she has placed him in this idealistic view in her mind of being the perfect man. And if he was here, none of this would have happened to me. None of this hurt would have occurred. 
and I feel like every little girl idealizes their father like that, especially when he's taken. There's there's no way she has nothing else to go on except for the way that he made her feel when she was alive and she felt safe. She so felt protected. That was probably the last time that she's felt secure in her life, because although ethic has been amazing to her, he isn't her blood. And I think that there is always an insecurity inside Morgan behind that. Even though we see him prioritizing her, we see him mm -hmm. putting her over his own kids sometimes. More, there's a disconnect. There is trauma there that stops Morgan from really giving him his just due when it comes to what he's done. He stepped up in ways that most men wouldn't. Absolutely. So, you know, with the butterfly, I, I, you know, I've been reading and you know me, I read different. I go and I read it and I read it again. Usually as soon as I finish, I read it again. Um, and I don't, I don't want to use the wrong word. So basically in my mind, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting, and you answered it earlier, but I'm expecting growth right away. You know, I'm expecting the butterfly to arise. And as I'm reading, I'm like, maybe they're not supposed to grow at the, the pace that I'm expecting them to grow. It's more of a butterfly effect. So what I'm reading in the Butterfly series is basically everything that Messiah and Morgan, all the problems that they started in the Ethics series, we're seeing them come full circle in Butterfly. And it's like, it's crashing head on. Oh, him, absolutely. him leaving, um, you know, even though, you know, he was he, in grave, gravely ill, him leaving left a gap. And I think Messiah thought he would just come back and fill that gap in nothing. No, no one would say anything. No one would notice. It's like, yay, you're back. Thank you for coming. But when he got, I'm not going to say rejection, but when he got, it, it was basically like everyone was like, welcome back but you could have stayed where you were it, it, you know except blue blue was to me was the happiest to see them and it was like thank god you're alive but you caused so much pain on us that it's hard for us to just forget that you were gone and we went on with our lives and that's what i see everybody went on with their lives and messiah expected them to stop and just fill him back in where he left and it's not happening and he's upset about it. I think That's why I, I don't I don't understand about him. I think anybody would be upset about it though. So I always try to get readers to look at the book from every angle in every character because Morgan's gonna feel differently about the return than Messiah will. Um Meek will feel differently than Issa. Ethic will feel differently than Bella. His absence affected everybody in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I think Messiah, because he connected with Morgan before he left so potently, he knew what he was leaving behind. He knew what he asked Ami to do. He did not expect someone else to fill in the gap so potently. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't mad that somebody filled in the gap. He was mad that the gap replaced what he did while he was there. But time doesn't really stand still. You know, his time stood still for Messiah because he was dying. It, it stood still. Every, everything that I just said about Benny and Morgan, Messiah did the same thing with Morgan. He idealized her in his head. That whole time period that they spent together was perfect for him. Even though it crashed and burned at the end, even though he fucked up at the end, everything positive that he felt for that girl, all the love is intensified because he was dying. Those were his last days or so he thought. Whereas after that, Morgan has moved past that moment. Messiah is stuck in that time period. It's almost like when somebody goes to jail, they're stuck in, in 2003 when everybody else, we in 2023, 20 years have passed. We have felt this hurt. We have felt the loss of you. We have mourned. We have wondered. We have spent sleepless nights. Whereas Messiah is just catching up to all of those emotion. Mm -hmm. He came back and he's still two years ago. So he has to, he's looking at Morgan now like you out here dancing, you out here you know, you you fucking my best friend, like y'all going on double dates. It don't seem like you was that sad sis, but he 
<laughs> missed her moments. You know, he missed mm -hmm. that depression. He missed her trying to kill herself. He missed her not being able to get out of bed, not being able to eat and sleep. He didn't see that. So now he's seeing the after effect after, mm -hmm. and I won't say healed because she's not healed. That is very much so a trauma moment in her life. But he's seeing the portion where she finally felt like, okay, I can, life can be good again. I can put my life back together. And he came back at that exact moment and he didn't like how that felt because it felt like they moved on without acknowledging his absence, but they all, they have already acknowledged that pain. Um, and it, it pissed him off. It made him feel like somebody else stepped into his life and they didn't even appreciate the role that he played to bring them all together. He just feels displaced. He doesn't feel like he belongs in any of their lives anymore. It, it's kind of like, you know, the Christmas movie where it's the ghost of Christmas past, present, and future. So it's like, you, you know, in that movie, we're looking at a dream. He's seeing it, but nobody knows he's there. With, whereas in Butterfly 5, it's, it's real life. You're seeing it as real time. Like, Masai is actually there. You're seeing how people have moved on with your their lives. Um, but the only person who I, I wish would have, who it seems has it, is Blue. And I don't I think, think she could. I don't think that Blue could. I think that Blue has a lot of... She has a lot of things we have to take into consideration, right? Blue comes from a place of addiction and recovering addicts rely on a routine to, to not go back to that place. Messiah became her routine, taking care of Messiah, expecting him to pull up on her, the accountability that he gave her, that kept her straight for a long time. So losing him she couldn't let that go. She couldn't let his memory die. And then being pregnant with his child felt like a gift. Like this is another chance for me to be okay. Like he left something behind with me. So she had something else at stake. Her, her experience with Messiah was a little bit different than everybody else's. She relied on him in a different way to exist in her world. She, she used, not used him in a negative sense, but she used his presence in her life in more than a friendship way, in more than a I love him way. He was accountability for her. He was safety for her. And if she let that go, Blue might have been lost a long time ago. Yeah. I, and I can see that. My thing is with, with Messiah, um, Blue lost and I, I don't want to say everybody, but she lost everyone. She, she lost her mother. She lost her father. She lost Noah. And now she's lost Messiah. And I, I, I never thought I'd say this, but I, I was the most disappointed in him in this book. Um, and the reason why, I think Messiah is stuck on his way or the highway. It's basically like, I'm going to let Blue go while I get my stuff together, but I feel and I fear that if Blue finds her way and finds another guy, he's going to be upset about it. He's going to treat her how, as this how he treated Morgan. He wants Blue to be at his beck and call. When he dismissed her, how he dismissed her, if she moves to like she she like she was going to do moves to LA with Iman, it's going to be an issue. So I think um, Messiah and Morgan both have to let go of that. They want to control the situation. And when it doesn't go their way, it, it becomes more of a, you know, a dramatic pull for, for, for the both of them. So to me, they're more alike than they are different. Oh, absolutely. And, I, and how do you, okay, so I know with the way it's going, it seems as if we saw them drift apart and we're, now we're seeing them come together. Do you think, and, and I just want from a, a, a fan perspective, do you think the fans want to see Morgan and Messiah work it out? Or do you think they, they're more of a, you know, they run their course, we, we want a different ending? How do you I feel about the that? fans are split directly down the middle. I think some fans are nostalgic and they want that Eminem bubble back. Mm -hmm. I think they want them to have the chance to live out everything that they started. Like what would Eminem look like had 
Wozy not shown up? Had the scene at Blue's house not occurred? What, where would they be right now if, if Messiah had never left? If he had stayed and been accountable for the plot against Ethic and you know revealed that he was sick, where would their journey have gone? I think that that is a beautiful thing to try to envision because we cannot deny that these two characters were completely in love with one another. We we can yeah. never forget what they felt like on the page. Um, and then I think that our own human experience weighs in on where we want Morgan to go. So I think the people that may may have a Messiah at home, who may have stuck with somebody through imperfect years and through a little bit of hurt, I, I feel like they're rooting for Messiah because it's very realistic. It's very much so what we put up with in a different version in real life. I think the women who maybe have been hurt by a Messiah, who put their all into a man like Messiah and it did not pan out, or who have identified pieces of pain in relationships with men like Messiah and didn't feel like it was worth it, want to see Morgan move on with someone who is treating yes. her better from the beginning. So I, I really think it's 50-50. I think just we are imprinting our own experience on this story and deciding what way we want her to go. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. Um, also, with the Messiah leaving, it kind of caused Issa to step up to the place as a, a protector of Morgan. So you see Issa filling the gaps, as we, you know, you may say, um, he wants to make sure she's happy. And if it comes to him having to step to, to me about being wrong on him, having to step the Messiah about being wrong on even when he had the conversation with Blue. It, it seems that Issa has grown, um, has a love for Morgan that, that really blossomed over the series. He wants to see her happy. And I don't think he cares who, um, who has to suffer for her, her to finally find her happiness. How is Issa coming to that place? Because it, it's like he puts um, her on a pedestal right I now. Don't think, I don't think that he has an investment in her happiness. I think he has an investment in being honest about the situation, right? I think mm -hmm. I don't think he is a yes man in any sense of the word, not to Ethic, not to Meek, not to Messiah. He is going to just tell it how it is and tell it how it played out without considering how anybody feels. Like he is the one that will say anything out his mouth. He don't care if you get mad. He don't care if you pull your gun. Like Messiah done threatened to kill this nigga. Like he just don't care. He's like, bro, it is what it is. You know, like he also has bonded with Morgan and more specifically her kids. So before Messiah left, they were very much so a friend group, right? They were mm -hmm. friends. He knew that was Messiah's girl. You know, they would kick it. He liked her, his, you know, he liked Aria. It was very, I don't want to say casual, but it was very, uh, friendly. After they looped back and they they developed this bond with Morgan and her kids, it became a little bit more than friendly. They almost became a little family. Um, and I think the kids is what elevates that bond. Those kids just made them accountable to Morgan in a different way. They did care about what happened to her. They did care if a man was putting his hands on her. They did care if a man was making her uncomfortable or making her feel like she had to be somewhere she didn't want to be. It was almost like Messiah left her with soldiers and she's used to being behind ethics kingdom, protected behind ethics name. And really when Messiah left, he made Morgan a queen. Morgan was protected by people that had nothing to do with ethic. They was protecting her based off Messiah's memory, and then it got deeper. Mm -hmm. It went deeper once her and Amik developed their relationship. Now she's family. Now we protecting her regardless. Um, and that that is a double-edged sword for Messiah because when he returns, now they have this allegiance to Messiah, but they also got this deep allegiance to Morgan. And right now, Morgan and Messiah not one. So Issa they is just... <laughs> no, they, they're not one. They're not on the same side. Like, 
So Issa is just telling it how it is. He's not sparing no feelings. He's he's. He, he got a relationship with Blue, but Blue was picking a fight. She was really kind of barking up a tree that he knew. He knew those branches were going to fall. He already knew how Morgan was going to react to Blue saying what she was saying. So he like, look, just chill out. Like, leave it alone. Like, this ain't the time. This ain't the play. All right. When she blow up, because he knows her. He already knew how she was going to react. Um, he's just going to tell it how it is every single time. He don't really care who gets offended. He don't care if Meek Man, Messiah Man. Mm -hmm. He'll tell Morgan she being a hoe. Like, he just don't care. Like, he's going to tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? So, okay. And that was the thing. Because I know a lot of people said, you know, blue overstep and, and, and whatnot. But I, I want to know how can we say that she overstep when Messiah just did the same thing in the previous book with her. She with allowed her. That's the difference. She a lot. People are only going to do what you allow them to do. He overstepped too. He was dead wrong in his interaction with Iman, but Blue backed him. She allowed him to overstep his boundaries with her child's father. Whereas Messiah, this is the thing that I respect about Messiah. He is livid with Morgan right now. He don't agree with nothing she's doing. He thinks she's got some disloyalty on her. He think he got, she got a little bit of hoe in her. Like he is very much so disappointed with the decisions that Morgan is making since his return. Mm -hmm. He still loves her. He still values her. He still ain't gonna let nobody have nothing over her head. Even though he empowered Blue, it yeah. was his information to deliver to her. And I think he would have in his own time. I think he would have eventually... Maybe not everything, probably not MJ, but I think if he really wanted to get back in a space with Morgan where they could coexist and maybe even build in the future, I think he would have eventually gotten to that place of transparency. Blue tried to rush that transparency and she did it in a way that felt damaging, that felt malicious. She didn't she that was his information to deliver she didn't follow his lead so he drew a line in the sand like no you can't you can't ever intentionally try to hurt this girl that i love and i think that 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 was the intention in that scene i think blue i feel like she was intimidated a little bit by morgan and, and a little jealous and i think she was in her feelings because those babies were there her baby mm -hmm. is not there you know that's a lot for a woman and i'm not saying she was wrong for speaking up for herself. But when you start to speak up and you're telling somebody else's truth, like that was his truth to tell Morgan. And I, I do feel like she overstepped. And the thing it, it, about that is, uh, you know, the scene before that, when he got her to come, she, you know, she told him, you know, I'm in love with you. And he says, I know. And I, I think that scene and, and when they were at the graveyard, it, it kind of pissed me off because if someone says they're in love with you and you say you know, and you don't want to be with them, you don't see you got yourself being with her, you should have left her right there in her house. Yeah, he should have left her in her house a long time to ago. To me, though. when you invited her, when you had her come, that put, and I'm not going to say false hope, because, but that's exactly what I see. When you had her come there, knowing that your baby mom was going to be there, knowing that Kadeem, it's like Messiah... Messiah's created drama. And I, I, I don't think he I intended to. He's it. had Blue in pocket for so long. Like, she's always going along. She's and always... That's, what we, that's, that's the problem. So long. Those two years blurred everything. So now, two years ago, you had her in your pocket. Yeah. This is Blue now. You have come back. The first person you came to see was Blue. You yeah. have the, you know, when you needed her, someone the most, Blue was there. She didn't move on with her life. She stayed there. She was, she was the one person who I felt was loyal to her. She is biased. I don't blame her. Messiah is her friend first. Mm -hmm. You know, she wants to elevate what they have, and that's fine. But to me, it's like Messiah. You're too old to act like a like an eleven year old. And this is my problem with Messiah. You're grown. And I really want him to start acting his age. He's acting like a 17-year-old who just got, you know, uh, 
basically I got I got I started messing with this person. I got her pregnant. I got someone else pregnant. Oh well, they got to deal with it. Messiah has not fixed what has what he has broke, and that's my problem with Messiah. You're study breaking things, right? You, when are you going to fix that, it? I think that you can't fix two women at once. He, you can't. He's been right. He's been allowing blue to exist in a space of intimacy that should have never existed. Not if you're in love with somebody else, right? Exactly. I think if he had acknowledged, um, or not even acknowledged, I think if if their relationship had grown to what it is now before he met Morgan, Morgan would have never existed. He would have chosen Blue. But because Morgan existed and because of the debt he owes her, the emotional debt that he owes this girl, Blue never really stood a chance. He can't let that go until he can't fix both of them at the same time. And when Blue put him in a position to have to choose, to have to pick a side, he chose the side where he feels like the debt is, is greatest. He really wants. And also him and Blue have a chapter that can be closed. They, their chapter can be closed. They don't have a living child. They don't have anything outstanding that has to be fixed. He has to deal with Morgan. He has to to fix this in order for his children to even see, okay, that their mother and father did love one another at a point in time. And that's important for him. He don't want, he does not want their relationship to remain as it is, that it is killing him to be at odds with this girl. So you can't love two people at the same time. People try to all the time and somebody gets hurt. Blue was the sacrifice that he felt he needed to make in order to repair or to even have a chance to repair things for his children. It's not even about him and Morgan romantically right now. Messiah needs a family. He needs to be a part of a and family. That's, that's the, and that's where, where my confusion was because you have a family with Blue and Savior. You, you've but always had are, that family. His kids are somewhere else though. Before those kids, maybe, he probably could have let Morgan go, but his children are somewhere else. His children don't know him. His daughter really can't even stand him. He hasn't bonded with them. He doesn't really know what they like, what they dislike. He wants a chance to have a real family that he can be there for, that don't mention his name and feel pain or feel loss or absence. And Blue and Savior don't make up for that. He loves them. He'll, if Blue called him tomorrow and needed something, he would probably deliver. But the space that she wanted to move into is not 100% available right now. She tried to rush something that she rushed it. She she showed her cards way too early. And that's, uh, I'm glad you brought that up about the family. Because um, I want to get into Meek. Um, I, you know, my, my, my love for Meek is to the stars, to the moon. I'm head over here. Oh my God, I love Meek. You know, um, but it, it seems as if and, I, you know, I want to, to go there because I feel just like Blue, how you said, played their cards too early. I feel Meek may have too. And this is this is my issue with, with him. He was willing to, you know, put Morgan above a friendship. And she was as well. She knew that friendship um, would no longer stand once they decided to be together. Um, however, their... I'm going to say they left a lot of loose ends too. Morgan with her indecisiveness, him with flipping to Livy on and off. And, and this is my issue. I, I hear a lot of people, especially in the group, because I'm in there a lot, saying, you know, oh, Livy played her cards wrong. He didn't want Livy. He didn't. My thing was in, in book four, Livy told him, Let, go ahead and be with her. I'll, I'll, I'll walk away. He in turn sent his address to her to come to him. To me, that was your decision. So rather uh, Morgan decided to be with someone else or not, you still chose Libby. That, in that moment, you chose her. Whether, you wanted, whether she was a consolation prize is, is a different story. But he did, in fact, choose Libby. You know? Mm, so I don't, think he cho I don't think he ever chooses Libby, and that's the issue. Um, I think Libby is convenient, and I think that men love convenient women. I think men love women that they can always go back to. 
I think they love women that let them come and go. I think they love women that are easy. I think they love women that do whatever they want them to do. All men love that. All men mm -hmm. got convenient pussy. Excuse my language. And she, is, <laughs> you know, she's convenient pussy. She's somebody he's been messing with for a while. She, it was never pressure. You know, he was always able to dip in and out with Livy because she had her own situations as well. She was never pressing him like that. And if we're honest, she's not pressing him because she really even wants the spot. She don't want to lose. Livy is very much so a woman. Once he embarrassed her in that parking lot for Morgan, it is really a battle between Morgan and Livy. It really don't have nothing to do with Ami. She wants the prize and the prize just happens to be Ami. Oh, I've been around all this time and you giving this to this other girl, what? Oh, you dismissing me for this other girl? It's almost like she wants to teach, put Morgan in her place. Mm -hmm. He is a good consolation prize. Okay, he a good nigga. He gonna be a good father. He got, you know, a little paper. He gonna spend paper on me. He gonna make sure my bills pay. But it, this is a battle of egos between two women. It really don't even mm -hmm. have to do it, I mean. Yeah, we look better like that. Livy don't want to lose. Like Livy don't want to lose. So, with 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 um with Amik, him teaming up with Ethic um to for Bash and Christiana, that was a surprise for me. Mm -hmm. I honestly didn't see it. Be and the reason why Ethic doesn't trust many people, so for him to trust um Amik and you know I don't know if he know Hawk is involved, but that said a lot about him and. Meek's relationship through the series because it was one point in time he didn't want anything to do with him. He wanted to see his face. Mm -hmm. But we see now that they're teaming up to help Morgan and, you know, get rid of this family that has caused her so much pain. So how, when you did that, is is there a how can, I, okay, so we, we know that, you know, uh, same thing with Buki. They, Buki, they were thinking about, you know, ethic and the power he has, the influence he still has. And we see uh, Hawk trying to push a product. And he, he has, now he has the Miami boys on, you know, in, in formation. And, and I, I think that ethic would be the end of, really? Would that put Hawk on a, a level that he wants to be on by well, I can't I can't go into the goals of Hawk in book six. I will say that powerful men like to be connected to other powerful men. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like in Amik is a, a means to an end for Hawk to get next to Ethic. Um, Ethic trusting Amik, he trusts Amik's love for Morgan. That is what he's leveraging in this relationship. He still don't really too much care for him, but he has shown him enough to know that whatever he's experiencing with his daughter is authentic. And I might have misjudged that relationship based on my relationship and loyalty to Messiah. That's that's what rubbed Ethic the wrong way about it from the beginning. He ain't with the you messing with your homeboy, your your baby daddy homeboy. Um, he also he understands the streets. So he also understands how Amik and Issa ended up in the plot against his life with Messiah. Those were Messiah's niggas. That, that's his crew. They didn't owe him any loyalty. So he understands how that whole thing played out. The plot is dead. He's not worried about the plot. He ain't really ever worried about Issa or Amik or Messiah. He's ethic. He ain't really worried about none of them. Um, he disapproved of the, the crossing of lines after Messiah died. Um, but he also understands love. He understands relationships. He understands having a draw to a woman you're not really supposed to have a draw to. He understands all of those things because he's living. Mm. Yeah. Um, so Why? it comes to a point where he has yeah. to let Morgan make her own decisions, whether he agrees with it or not. And he does trust Amik's love for Morgan in order to partner with him to protect her. He'll, he'll, he trusts that. There's, there's no reason for him not to trust it. And typically, if we were in Ethic series, Ethic 1, he would have called on, on Messiah to protect Morgan in that way. 
But Messiah has a different role in his life now. Messiah is now family. Messiah is now the father to his grandchildren. He can't put Messiah in the same position that he would have put him in. Can't put him in harm's way. Ten books yes. ago. You know, and Messiah will probably feel a way about that because Messiah prides himself on being ethics shooter. He prides himself on being that that piece on the chessboard, but he can't play that role anymore because if something happens to Messiah, it affects the family now. It's not just ethic losing a shooter, it's his grandchildren losing their father. Oh, so yes. he, he can't tap him for that role anymore. So instead, he taps somebody he don't really give a fuck about. He don't care if me come out of this alive or not. Mm. You know, he gonna use his chess pieces in the way that best fits the scenario, and Meek is disposable to ethics. So, gotcha. yeah, this is where I need you right now. Okay, since we're talking about ethics, poor ethic. Ethic has to relive everything he just <laughs> fixed <Me too. laughs> in this. And I'm like, as I'm reading, I'm like, oh my God, when she woke up and asked for Lucia, oh my God. Yeah. I'm like, you know, you know, you ask the question, you like, do he tell her and, and have to relive, you know, the, the 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 pushing away and you know, rejection again, or does he just go on like nothing ever happened? That is the, when I wrote it, right, because I was very close to killing Alani. Like, I felt like she could go. I felt oh, like this series oh, no. without her. I was like, okay, I, I could be done with her. Mm -hmm. um, and then creatively, I had to just sit with where I wanted this family to go. And her forgetting everything felt like a fate worse than death. I was like, this is worse than him losing her. You know, having to re-earn her, having to live with that guilt of her not knowing again, it, it almost reset the, we almost right back at the end of ethic one. So he has to, and I say he, because once I, I had a completely different vision for B5. Once I got into the story and my fingers got to going, these characters started doing what they wanted to do. Opposite. So <laughs> to decide if, how moral does he, how moral are, are you? Are you so moral that you will sacrifice everything that you've built with this woman? Because I, I can't see Alani forgiving this twice. You know what I mean? Like, I can't see her coming back twice. So are you going to sacrifice everything that you've built with this woman, this life? Y'all went through so much to get to this place where you could live in harmony and in unison. And you've built this family for your morality or... Are you going to keep her in the dark and do what's best for the greater good? Because lying covers them all. It covers his children. It covers this new baby. It salvages his marriage. Even Nani and Nair is like, don't tell her. But mm -hmm. the character that we know is Ezra Ethic Okafor. He has a strong moral code. Um, so we have to we have to see if he goes against himself and everything that he stands for as a man to keep his family together or... Will he tear his family apart with with a hard truth? I, I really don't know yet. Also, you know, off of that, um, we know that Morgan is a suspect in the murder case of and a missing persons case for the Royals. It, it I don't want to, I don't want to guess, but it, it seems like you know, ethic is is really pushing for the sacrificial lamb to be our meat. Um, I mean, he was the mind. one they saw. He would was not the one they saw. Um, <laughs> He was the one they saw come to the classroom for a bash. Him sitting yeah. in the classroom, everybody thought it was so smooth. And I'm like, why is he showing his face? Like, it's just, you know, I think it was, it, it was a cover. I think Meek is ready to, to give it all up for Morgan, to keep Morgan safe. That's his love for her. It seems like he makes the ultimate sacrifice. I think, I think when you when you love anybody, you have to be willing to make the ultimate sacrifice, um, whether it's stupid or not, whether it puts you in harm's way or not. We've seen all men in this series do that. We've seen Ethic do that. We've seen um, Messiah do that every time he ran to Morgan's rescue, every time he took another life for her. Um, and now we see Amik doing that. I think the the purpose 
and the intention behind the scenes that I write in which these men give the ultimate sacrifice, they put these women first, is to drill in the point that Black women are worth that type of commitment. They're oh, worth yeah. that sacrifice. They're worth that dedication. This is fiction, so it's dramatized to the highest level I can do it. You know, my book's going to be full of drama. It's going to be full of circumstances that will never exist in the real life. But the message is, no matter how flawed these Black women are, no matter how difficult they are, no matter how many times they disappoint these men, they are going to show up for them because they deserve it. Um, and and I, it's just Amik's turn. Like, it, it doesn't make sense for it to be Messiah right now. We already know how hard Messiah would ride for Morgan. We already know this. We've seen this. He's done it a million times. He'll do it a million times again, but he has more to lose right now. And Ethic is not going to risk that under any circumstance. Uh, and that makes perfect sense. Another thing I wanted to talk about, um, y'all, we, we, we were reading the series, you know, we just think, and, and you know me, I'm like toddler issues. Cause you know, growing up with a, you know, infant, you know, they have ear aches, especially when they tease and you know, you know, the little things come, but I don't think anyone really took into account the way she, you know, behaved, how she wasn't as excited. You know, usually when you get twins, one is the calm one and one is the one that's bouncing off the wall. So that's what I took from it. Also, I just really thought she couldn't stand a daddy, you know? <laughs> I, I, honestly, it's like every time she see him, it was like, oh, there go that man. Like she was just Not disappointed. You, you know, so definitely I, I never saw the, the the cancer scare coming. The even, you know, the the in-depth about how she has been sick. And, and when we look back at it, I think everybody was like, yeah, she was acting, you know, a little off. I just personally thought she didn't like Messiah. You know, I Messiah think, just got... I think most people attributed Yali's differences to her disability, to her being deaf. Mm -hmm. um, that was another thing. And they, they counted her out as the different twin. You know, like maybe they, they associated with her being a little delayed, a little behind, a little slow. When if you have really ever interacted with a deaf person, like I have deaf people in my family, they're just like you and me. They have the same abilities and capabilities. Like they are just like a hearing person. Non-hearing people are the same as hearing people. So the sickness, the lethargy, the lack of energy, the that is not a symptom of deafness. And I think that because people assume that, but these are the same things that people assumed of Morgan. They thought she was slower. They didn't really pay attention. They, you know what I mean? Like these are stereotypes that she lived through. And that's what I was going to go through. Like, uh, and, it, and I do like that you, you know, with your LGBTQ, um, when you write about disabilities, you do have it to where we're seeing the, the non-biased aspects of them like we saw morgan still in clubs still dancing still causing havoc still having crushes still mm -hmm. you know and she's deaf and yep. we see a white boy nick he's still he's rolling with the thugs he's you know uh, able to talk to meek and, and isa and, and he's not being looked at as Ugh, don't get away from me i don't deal with you because you're gay it's very they're very accepting of, of him and i do like that you put that in in the books to let people know listen just because you're gay doesn't mean you can't hang with the homies. Just because you're a deaf doesn't mean you can't go out and party. They do it too. They're just like you. And I, I do like that part because I never would have imagined, and you know, I, I didn't grow up with anyone deaf, so I wouldn't imagine a deaf person going to the club. I'm like, what What can they do? What can they, they hear? Lit. They be lit. And you, you know, like, they and you like, like they too. you know, and you, how you said she can feel the vibrations of the music. And I've heard you know, reading and, and you know, writing, um, watching specials. I do see, you know, the deaf people and how they say they communicate with the, the vibrations and everything with music. So it, it, it it's, I, I do like that you include that in your writing because somebody like me who isn't exposed to that, I wouldn't know how deaf people live. Mm -hmm. You literally put me right in their life to where, oh, okay, she lives normal. Everything yeah. is normal to her. So yeah. I, I, you know, that's the aspect of your writing that I think 
um, more people appreciate and should talk about than they do. So that is uh, one of the pluses with you. Um, it was one more thing I wanted to speak about. Um, and we're going to go back to blue. So it seems as if, you know, I remember um, as the series was starting, Blue was crew. You know, mm -hmm. she was one of the homeboys. She was one of the people that, but it seems like, you know, uh, after Messiah left, was it the crew that drifted away from Blue? Or was it Blue that drifted away from them? How? how I think it was... So I think sometimes people want to see everything and there's no way for me to tell mm -hmm. every single aspect of this story. So you have to listen to what I say when I say it. You know, it, Blue was clear that she pulled away from them. She pulled yes. away from everybody because she was hiding. Yes, she was honored to be pregnant by Messiah, but she was also a little bit of ashamed to be, a preg be pregnant by Messiah. Like she understood that they crossed a line, you know? So she was grieving in her own way. She was pregnant with his baby. People would have questions. People would need explanations. She retreated into a place of solitude that was safe for her to bring this baby into the world. She wasn't looking for Issa or Amik. She, we don't know if they called her or not. We know what she said. We know that she said she pulled away. Um, so we have to we have to take that 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 is what her experience was through grief. They also went full fledged into the streets like they lost somebody that meant something to them. And I think that people forget that the women in the book weren't the only people grieving Messiah. His friends grieved him and they ain't going to cry about it. They ain't going to write no diary entries about it, but they probably were real harsh in the streets. They probably went full-fledged into the drug game. They probably was robbing a lot of trucks. They they probably were a little bit more reckless and a little bit more emotional in the way they moved throughout the street. Niggas probably lost fingers and lives and it just wasn't the same grief that Blue and Morgan went through because it wasn't a romantic relationship. It was a relationship between three men. Mm -hmm. um, so they all just went on their patterns of grief. They all went their own ways in dealing with the loss of this person that meant something to them. And she did not want to be contacted. She couldn't even stay focused enough to contact Morgan. She was focused on her own path to figuring out what life looked like without Messiah while raising his child. And then finding out that that child was sick. Blue, mm -hmm. Blue didn't have no- and She had her own issues. Yeah, she mm -hmm. didn't have no energy for nobody else. I don't want nobody around. I'm trying okay. to- get through this space in my life. Yeah, because I, I know a lot of people felt like her not getting in touch with Mo was basically a, a, um, a jealous move. Like, no. oh, I wouldn't tell her. Be, it was just, it was human. It was like, I'm dealing with my yes. own stuff right now. I don't have time to deal with yes. Morgan. So how, can she be, how can she be accountable for Morgan's grief when she had not settled her own? She was pregnant by this man. She didn't know Morgan was pregnant. It ain't like she knew, you know, that Morgan was going through the same thing she was going through. It's not even like Messiah was still alive for her to compete with Morgan over. It had nothing yeah. to do with Morgan. It was no malicious intent in that portion of the series that would stop her from reaching out to Morgan. She was grieving. Her and Messiah connected in a different way during his transition. So when he finally left and went away and she thought he was gone i ain't got I, I don't have the capacity to be this this delivery person this you know this executor of your last wishes she was dealing with her own shit that's understandable um can you clear up margaret's birthday child uh-uh i don't don't <laughs> come to you tomorrow. Don't count my mental math because then I'm gonna have to go back and think about what I said and what I wrote. Because I, I know uh in Mop to the Flame we I feel we, like it's we, in the summer. Yeah. And it's I remember you saying um when Ethic once started, uh that it was more towards August. It was more towards when school was starting. I feel like it's probably centered somewhere around my birthday, which is August 14th. Um yeah. just simply that's what I, that's how I write, you know, that's how I write. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever mentioned a specific date though, but I do know I do remember in Multiple Flame establishing that it was a birthday party that happened in the summer mm -hmm. annually for Benny Atkins' youngest daughter. Um, 
but don't count my mental math because I don't I, I don't know my I would literally have to do the research throughout my own series to mm -hmm. give you an accurate answer. Okay. Okay. I thought we we you know, and I remember it at the one because the mid semester started October ish, uh, when Morgan left. And the, the flame with her and, and and Messiah started, you know, around her birthday in August. So it was August. That definitely and September. started the school year. Yeah, which yeah. is September. Yeah. Okay. Well, I really enjoyed this sitting down with you. I did too. I, um, Thank you for inviting. I love getting your insight on things, especially you know things that have me confused. I think you cleared up a lot of stuff. I have one more question. Will Issa and Aria make it? I don't. So the one thing that I love about Issa and Aria is that they are Issa and Aria. They don't really change up. They don't really explain their love, but. In a relationship like that, you got to be on the same page. And I think Aria is pausing a lot of her youth for him. Um, I also think that he is pulling her to places sexually that may not be comfortable for her. Mm -hmm. I also think that she's a little bit unfair because he was who he was when they met. Yeah, and he never made mm -hmm. promises to be anybody other than that hood nigga that she fell in love with. I think that they need time to figure it out. I think the more that she sees Morgan go through with Messiah and I'm meek, I think the more it kind of scares her into feeling like I could be wasting my time with this man. Like there's no way that this is going to work out long term. Um, and I think Ari is being a little bit selfish right now. But in your early 20s, I think that's the time you're supposed to be selfish. I think that's, yeah. you know, she ain't supposed to be prioritizing him or what he wants or where they want to go or their engagement. She's supposed to be a little selfish and on some bullshit and she's finally standing up and saying like, yeah, I'm going to pull back. And I think people were upset with her about that, but I think that that was the smartest choice for her in this moment in the series. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I, I do think that, you know, you're, especially your early 20s. And I think, uh, I don't want to, you know, jump to conclusions, but I think she's seeing what Morgan and, and Meek and Messiah is going. I don't think she wants that. I think she really wants to enjoy her early 20s Absolutely. And then when I'm mentally ready for this, then I'll jump into a relationship. I think she just wants to have fun. She do. I, I think it started out as fun and then it, you know, became a relationship. I think yep. she wants to get he that. Real fun fun the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, he was real fun. She ain't really had to worry about him too much. She wasn't worried about, you know, it just is it's getting heavy for her. And you're absolutely right. Morgan and Amik and Messiah is looking like they it's looking like a drop off at the end of this clip. <laughs> <laughs> you know, pull this over. Let me hop off this ride. So yes. she just she want to have fun. She want to be young. She don't want her heart to be broke. If anybody got to break hearts, it's gonna be her. So she like, let me get off of this while I still have the upper hand. Because if you break my heart, I might kill you. Like Aria is a little bit. <laughs> she she want to retain her composure and her control. So she like, let me off this ride. So so in book six, we have a lot of clearing up. Messiah has to clear up some things. Ethic has to clear up some things. Morgan has to clear up some things. So I look forward to it. I think it's going to be the right clash, you know, uh, more. And I think because right now you're, you're gradually taking us to it. It won't be a train wreck. It won't be a head-on yeah. collision. But the, the, it, it has to be things, a groundwork laid in, in Ethic 6 for them to continue. Because right now it everybody is holding too many secrets yeah and i think by holding these secrets is making it worse instead of you know it does when you try to make a decision based on half information you make bad decisions you know what i mean like there's no way for you to make a good decision when you don't know everything and ethic has i mean life-changing secrets that he's holding messiah yeah. has secrets that provide clarity on why he moves the way he moves and why he is the way that he is. And nobody can really truly love you until you expose that trauma, until you expose that level of hurt that you've been masking. Like he is a highly aggressive man, but he is aggressive because he was mistreated as a child. Yes. You know, like, of course, aggression sprouted from that. 
Morgan don't know that though. You know, it's very it's very few people in the series who knows that. Um, and she may react differently when finding that out. We don't know because he doesn't give her the chance to receive the information. He's very used to controlling things and to making decisions for her. Um, and he has to trust that she can receive this information and not judge him for it and not use it against him. But he's he's scared. He's stuck in the point of his trauma, which was a child. He was a boy. So we're looking at a man. He's a grown ass man, but he's really kind of a boy. He's stuck in that space where he was hurt. Um, and Kadeen is trying to get him out of that. And it'll be interesting to see how he evolves through book six, because there's a there's one moment in book five when Messiah finds out Amik has a baby on the way with Libby. And it is the most graceful I have ever seen Messiah. And when I wrote it, I paused a little bit because I was like, wait a minute, is this even how Messiah would react? Because this is like a bullet in his chamber. This is what he'd yeah. been waiting for, you know? And I left it because my first instinct was, this is, grace for Morgan. This is grace for our meat. This is growth in this man who would normally load this bullet in this chamber and blow everything to pieces. And it, that was all I needed to, to write to know this character is going somewhere and it is upward. It is not downward. He is growing. And it was a, it was a small moment and I'm sure so many people missed it. But it was a moment that made me pause when writing. And not a lot of moments make me pause when writing. I'm, I'm full steam ahead. But I, I paused. And I was like, wait a minute. What's, what's happening with him here? And I was proud of him in that moment. I was proud of him in a way, um, in the same way that I was proud of Ethic when he got baptized. It just was a, it was a transition. Like, he is becoming somebody else. Like, uh -huh, like, uh -huh. yeah. as squeaky as you think he was. Yeah, it was... It was a moment that was not very messiahish. It was given a lot of ethic, and I was <laughs> proud of him for getting to that place. Okay. Well, I enjoyed my discussion with you. I hope we cleared up some things. I hope we answered a lot of questions. Me too. Um, thank you for joining me, Ashley. Hopefully, we can do it again next book. Um, you know, get more clarity of it because I love it. And it's like you say, you did turn a bunch of non readers into readers with your book. And I remember as Ethic was coming out, it was like crack. It was we in inboxes. And I remember once you used to now stop inboxing me. Like you, <laughs> you were <laughs> you were really like, oh my God, like it like that series right there. I think that was a turning point in black literature, uh, black urban literature, because we had never read anything like that. You literally took us through the ringer with that and i loved it like ethic to this day when i'm recommending a series that right there is top five in series i've ever read i Thanks. love that series so just you know you 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 gave you gave us what we needed at the time when we needed it so you you know you got readers who didn't really read into reading again and you know i think you've done a lot for this industry and i'm actually so proud of you because I watched you put in your blood, sweat, and tears with the rollouts. With you know, with the when you introduced us to, we were getting the books in the little cute little boxes, yeah. and it was just something we never saw before. You you literally changed a lot for indie writers. That just seeing your blueprint and how you went about it, it was groundbreaking. And we just thank you for that. You are very, very, very important to this industry. And I'm so glad that you are able to interact with your friends. You don't turn us away. You don't look down on us. You, every chance you get, you're thanking us. And I just thank you for being humble, thank for you. being kind, and for being generic. You are literally the epitome of grace right now. And I really enjoyed this voyage with you. It's been a great journey. So just thank you for joining me. Thank, thank you for you. sharing your art. And thank you for being you. Thank you, my. The honor literally is mine. It is all mine. Thank you so much for having me. I had a great time. And yes, count, count me in for the next discussion. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm going to end this. So goodbye, sister girl. Bye.